Hey, what's up, everyone? Today we start our first class of Maturity by Sinclair Ferguson. I know a lot of you guys were wondering what book we're going to do for the theology class on maturity. And I should have told you it's literally Maturity by Sinclair Ferguson. But anyways, I, I, I want to create these classes because I want essentially to create an online database of teaching that I've done throughout the years. And I'm just thinking, you know, if I do this a couple times a year, you multiply that times five, ten years. I hope to create, you know, a, a giant database of classes to offer and, you know, they will be somewhat um, academic. They will be somewhat challenging and vigorous, not too much. And um, but I, I do want them to be challenging. So after I present chapter one, you're encouraged to read chapter one of the book. If you don't have the book, just go off of what I'm doing. Uh, think of like a college classroom where you have to buy the book, essentially, and you know, in college, no one really read the book, read the book. They just needed it for assignments or whatever. But in this case, the teacher teaches a class. You pay attention. You take notes, and then when it's time to ask questions uh, from the teacher to the student, then you can go back and watch the video again. You can go in your book and look for the answers, or just search your heart. But essentially, what I want to create is a just that uh, an online class, an online theology class to help you the church the future church our children grow when the time comes when they take these classes themselves so let's get right into chapter one of maturity the first class and essentially um you know i chose this book because i want what paul wants i want to present all of us to christ as mature and he highlights um colossians chapter 1 verse 28 and 29 listen to what the apostle paul says him we proclaim Christ we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ for this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me so even Paul's main objective was to present Christ to proclaim Christ and then from there to seek to in all wisdom present everyone mature in Christ with the energy that comes from Christ. See, Paul was a Christ preacher. He knew that it was going to be for Christ, by Christ, through Christ, to the glory of Christ. So Sinclair Ferguson starts off with that. It's Paul's goal. It's our goal to present everyone mature in Christ. It's truly, you know, when you think about what makes a healthy church, we think about what makes a a church that's solid, a church that's um, grounded in the truth, a church that's gospel centered and Christ centered, it's maturity. And this doesn't mean, you know, that we can't joke around or have fun. In fact, we should be joyful. In fact, true joy comes from Christians who are mature and know to have know how to have fun in Christ. But when you think about it, if our church, if the church in at large was a mature church, a church that knew her Christ, a church that knew her doctrine, a church that knew um, her theology and knew how to from head to heart to hand serve Christ I, I just think that the, the church would grow immensely because of that so you know we know that um, it's going to take time and patience we know that maturity doesn't happen overnight just like a tree that's growing it doesn't happen um, right away There there's time it, you, know, you plant the seeds and it takes time to, to take root and to blossom and to flourish and the same with us um, it, it is theology, but it's more than that. And and what causes, um, in the book, chapter 1, he says that, that there's some hurdles or road bumps that cause a hindrance to maturity. He says societal pressures and lifestyles, they're hard to resist. It's hard to be persistent. You know, what, what he gets there is societal pressures. It, it is something to be mature in Christ and having to be bold for Christ and stand up for your Christian values when society is caving in on you. Uh, lifestyles, you know, you're too busy. Uh, I'm, I'm too, I'm not a reader. I'm, I can't get down. My kids are this, or I work too hard, or by the time I get home, whatever it is, societal pressures, the lifestyle, it, it's hard to be mature in Christ. Perhaps our past, who we were in the past, doesn't allow us to press on forward. We'll get some of that in, in Philippians when we get into that section of maturity, or even just the Christian circles that we run in. I've, I've seen so many Christian circles where I just think, you know, those boys are just that. They're boys. They're not men. They're not men in Christ. Or those women, 
the, the, there's no seriousness. There's no deep rooted gospel conversations. It's not an atmosphere of joy in Christ. And again, we're not saying to be dry or to always be pious and, you know, always be thinking deep theological thoughts. That isn't it. But it's knowing how to, in the atmosphere of life, to be enjoying Christ, talking about Christ, seeking the good of others in Christ, and to enjoy truly maturing together in Christ, growing up together in Christ. So those are some hurdles, some road bumps. And ask yourself, what road bumps is causing me to have a lack of maturity? What am I giving into? What am I allowing the flesh to dominate me in that is allowing me or not allowing me to mature in Christ? Maturity is not optional. That, that's what he, he continues to get at in chapter 1. Maturity is not optional. It is the end of all Christianity to be mature in Christ, to be mature in Christ. Are we all going to achieve the same maturity level? Of course not. Will we be given different measures of grace? Of course. But maturity is not optional. We have to mature. Jesus himself, Sinclair Ferguson says, he's the trailblazer. He's the one who, who showed us that he himself matured. He was the most mature one. Jesus went from boyhood to manhood, growing in stature. He really grew up. Think about that. It's not a, a pseudo growing up. It's not just, um, you know, something that was just written in the scriptures for us. He really grew up. In fact, there's a quote from Irenaeus, the early church father. Let me read that to you real quick. It says here, Irenaeus of Lyons. AD 130 to 200, way back. This is what he says. Christ did not reject humanity, not go beyond, sorry, Christ did not reject humanity, nor go beyond its limitations. He did not abrogate, meaning reject, his laws for the human race in his own case. Instead, he sanctified each stage of life. Did you catch that? Every stage of life, Christ sanctified. He came to save all through his own person. All that is, who through him are reborn to God, infants, children, boys, young men, and old. Therefore, he passed through every stage of life. He was made an infant for infants, sanctifying infancy, a child among children, sanctifying childhood, and setting an example of filial love and affection, of righteousness and obedience, a young man among young men, becoming an example to them, and sanctifying them to the Lord. So also he grow, he was a grown man among the older men, that he might be a perfect teacher for all, not merely in respect of revelation of the truth, but also in respect of the stage of life, sanctifying the older men and becoming an example to them also. And thus he came even to death, that he might be the first firstborn from the dead, having the preeminence among all or in all things, the author of life who goes before all and shows the way. So he's our, he's our example. It's true. In every stage of life, Christ was a mature young man. Christ was a mature young little one. None of us should use our age, our circumstance, the stage of life that we're in as an excuse to not mature. Christ himself being mature, growing in stature, knowing the scripture, teaching, even in the temple at 12 years old. It's our example. But more than that, Christ purchased our maturity for us. Part of Christ's death on the cross was not just to save us in the here and now, but to sanctify us and to grow us and to mature us. If our end goal is to be mature, then you rest be assured that Christ purchased our maturity as well so that we may press into it. Let me read. Oh, well, let me give you a brief explanation of what goes on in chapter one. Sinclair Ferguson then goes on to list the different churches that were written to. He talks about Corinth. He talks about Philippi, he talks about Ephesus, he talks about Colossae, and he shows how the Apostle Paul to all these different churches is writing scripture so that they may become mature in Christ. Listen to 1 Corinthians 14. Let me just pull that up for myself so I can read it for you. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. It says this, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil. But in your thinking, be mature. That's rich. To things that are sinful, to the evil things. Yes, be infants to that. Don't taste that. Don't grow in that. But instead, in the things that are 
of Christianity, of the things that are of worthiness, mature, think maturely about those things. So Christ had it all. Co sorry, Corinth had it all. Corinth had a plethora of gifts. That's why Paul is having to address the gifts. Corinth had truly uh, factions. There was divisions. They had solid teachers. That's why some were going to this guy. Some were going to that guy. Some were going to this guy. So they had gifts. They had they had good teachers. They were they were they were blessed, but they forgot that their identity was in Christ. They forgot that they were to boast in Christ. They forgot that they were to essentially grow up into maturity and not go back to their old ways, causing divisions or boasting in self. And Paul remedies remedies their youthful way of thinking by showing the love section and that's why 14 follows the love section because it's saying this is what it is to be mature it's action in love it's self-denial and it's pressing on with christ therefore do not be children in your thinking but be mature in your thinking philippians uh, paul writes to them he calls them uh, you're my joy in my crown but then he gets into the nitty gritty. People are sowing seeds of division. They're no longer side by side for the gospel as they once were. They, they have lost the sight of Christ. So Paul's reminding them, press forward with Christ. Forget what lies behind. Press on with Christ until you attain full maturity. Keep your eyes on Christ. Maturity calls us to find security in Christ and the in the future with Christ, not our past. So ask yourself, in my maturity, am I pressing on? That's what Paul's getting at with the church at Philippi. Am I pressing on with Christ? Am I moving forward with Christ? Am I striving upward for the up, uh, toward the upward call of Christ? Or am I constantly living in the past, thinking about my childish ways? Am I truly maturing? So you have Corinth. You have uh, Philippi now you have Ephesus and now a lot of us know that the first three chapters of Ephesus are theological there's a lot of um, indicative meaning who we are in Christ what we've attained in Christ what Christ has done for us but the last three chapters are very practical and it's meant to be that way so that way we know that our gifting comes from Christ if this is who we are in Christ if this is what we needed to be saved from in Christ and and we extol the person of Christ, then we realize, oh, he's the gift giver. So for the maturing of Christians in Christ, we are receiving gifts, the gifts of teacher, prophet, evangelist, the, the, the workers of ministry, so that we will truly grow mature in Christ. Paul labored in Ephesus for two to three years. He taught daily for five years. Paul did all that he could for the maturity of, of the saints. In fact, reading this chapter I was really, you know, just stirred on thinking, you know, Spurgeon used to preach several times a week. Calvin used to preach servant several times a week. The Puritans would preach several times a week. Granted, they had their own church building and life was a little bit different back then. Um, but this is kind of what made me want to do these lessons is that minimum that I would offer some type of, uh, of content so that people could listen to from their pastor, from uh, their local church that that way they could grow that way i could be like paul even in a sense of laboring to teach daily for the maturity of our church it's clear it's clear that we are to become mature in christ and it's hard it's hard to repeat this day after day think about paul teaching every day to the church at ephesus it'd be hard to go every day to learn It'd be hard to set aside time every day to grow in maturity, but it's not too hard for us to check our phone every day. It's not too hard for us to spend 30, 45 minutes on social media every day to sit in front of the TV or Instagram or Facebook. So a quick question of maturity is, am I seeking to apply my free time to growth before I am to the flesh or to leisure? Am I seeking to use moments throughout the day that I have to use for whatever, quote unquote, I would like? Are we using those to mature in Christ? Imagine all those little five and 10 minute windows, 15 minute windows that if we just open up the word or if we sought to carry a book with us. If so, when we do have that time, we could just open up a book and read instead of 
uh, mindlessly surfing the web. Paul did this. Paul was leading by example. And Paul even joins them in the effort to grow mature. Perhaps this is why we're not mature, because we're not daily attending to the needs of our souls. So more questions to think about. Is it something in my past? Is it societal pressure? Is it my own laziness? Is it that I don't want to love and I keep thinking about uh, the, 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 the boasting that I can do in this life? What is it? What is it? And as I read from Colossians already, that Paul proclaims Christ so that we might become mature in Christ. Paul is writing to his friend. It's, it's actually Epaphras' congregation. When you read the, the letter, he's actually writing on, to Epaphras, on behalf of Epaphras, to the congregation, because it's essentially his, his church, Epaphras', and he wants to see them mature in Christ. That's what Paul's getting at. And I love what that verse said when I opened up. To this end, he labors and toils. His energy and his agony and his labor is for the maturity of the saints. And again, if that's Paul's heart, if that's how hard Paul worked to grow uh, believers mature in Christ, we should be tending the field of our own hearts as well. We should be cultivating our own hearts, seeking to grow and grow. So just in closing to this first class, we have the example of Christ, what Christ shown us, what he has shown us in his word with Christ, how he himself grew up. How he himself sanctified every stage of life. How he was mature in every step of his life. It's all under the lordship of Christ. And Paul knew this. It's the gospel that declares that we are to become mature in Christ. And this should be our goal, church. This should be what we desire as we begin this work of maturity. As we begin to seek, seek to grow in Christ and present ourselves as mature Christians. This will bring about a healthy church. This will bring about a church that is rich in community, that is planting deep roots in the gospel, that is living their life for the glory of Christ because they know him, because they spend time with him, because they get alone and pray with him, because they make it their life's effort to get to know the one who saved their souls. We need to be a mature church. We need to be a church that's growing up into maturity so that way in the future, when young believers come amongst us, when new believers come amongst us, there's our, I can already know, well, there's 40 mature adults out there that can bring them under their wings. Now, if I'm worried that our church is not mature and more young believers come, I think, oh man, who's going to lead it? Who's going to help? Thankfully, I see our church maturing. Thankfully, I see a lot of mature Christians in our, in our, in our church. I'm not trying to indict anyone. But the reality is that as we continue to strive for Christ and we become more mature in Christ, our church will be better for it. But most importantly, our hearts will be captivated by Christ in true maturity. So that's chapter one. It's just, a, again, a summary going through the the meat of what I got <clears throat> out of the out of the, the book, out of the, the chapter. Um, again, watch this as many times as you want. Watch it in two times speed. That way it's only eight to ten minutes long. And just try to realize what Paul's heart is toward the churches that he writes to. It's their maturity in Christ. It's their love for Christ. And Sinclair Ferguson highlights that beautifully in chapter one. Read the chapter if you have the book. And if you have time, if not, this this uh, class, it's an online class. This is the, the classroom setting here. Uh, should, should be enough. So here are some questions. And for the assignments, um, I ask that you either type these up or uh, call me if you want to talk about it, um, send me an email, whatever it is, however you feel like you can best accomplish the homework section, the assignment section, the your heart working section, then I leave that up to you. But here are the questions for you to contemplate. Define maturity. What is it to be mature? That's question one. Why is maturity important? That's question two. Did Christ mature in his life and how? That's three. Question number four. List areas where you see immaturity in your heart and life. Do you spend time in his word and prayer to fight immaturity? Do you struggle to let go of the past 
and it holds you back? Do you let outsiders stop you from being mature in Christ? What is your biggest hindrance to becoming mature in Christ? So it's essentially four questions, but the last one has a little bit more substance to it. So let me just read those off again. Number one, what is maturity? Number two, why is maturity important? Number three, did Christ mature in his life? And if yes, then how so? And number four, list areas of maturity in your heart and ask yourself, what's causing those things? Ask yourself, do I fight against those things through the word and prayer? Ask yourself, are you struggling to let go of the past? That last one, spend time, truly spend time chewing over that last one. What are some areas in my life that I'm allowing immaturity to stay and to keep going forward? And what's causing those and why am I not fighting those? Let's pray. Our gracious God, we're thankful that you provide this technology, Lord, where we can record classes and they're with us for good. Um, and you allow this to be an effective means of communication. We know in days gone by, people lived in cities that were within walking distance of their local church. And it was different, but they taught daily. They taught daily. They taught daily for the maturity of the saints, for the growth of your people. And Lord, may that be our hearts. Lord, we don't want to exhaust people. We don't want to uh, drain people, make people feel that they have to be at church or a church-related event every day. But we want to offer resources and content that people may grow. So Lord, I ask that you would bless this class, that you would bless those who are taking this class and bless their efforts, that you would help them to ask real heart-searching questions as they chew on the material and as they think about um, their maturity or lack thereof, Lord. For the sake of Christ and our maturity in Him, help us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.